I have no uh, thought or action not directly related to VRAD. We are moving on to 137 years of radiology malpractice. Now, the basis for my title is simply uh, based on VRAD scale and size. If you take the average radiology practice size and the average radiologist annual study volume, and you compare it to VRAD's average annual volume over the decade of cases that we're going to cover here, uh, you will see, uh, now what, what I did was I took the cases that closed over a 41 month period, because of course you're not allowed to discuss cases that are still pending, right? So the case has to close before you can present it as an educational exercise. Uh, so we have a 41 month period of cases that closed, but we had a fairly constant volume over the nine or 10 years of cases that actually contributed to those closed cases. So I took our average volume, I took the amount of time that this analysis spans, and it equates to the equivalent of 137 years of experience in MedMal for an average sized practice. So it's pretty spectacular numbers and I think VRED is uniquely positioned to be able to do this kind of analysis. So we are talking about missed cases here and I'd like to put that into context. VRAD has very robust QA data. And over the 20 years of its existence, we have run an average of about 1.3 major misses per thousand studies. That's what we call our major miss rate or MMR. Comparing that to the generally accepted literature, Wilson Wong was about five major misses per thousand. And that's one of the largest samplings of about 126,000 studies over red. We have over 60 million studies in our archives and probably about 40 million of those were over red. The SAFA study was a study of 700 trauma patients from a Dallas center and that found a very high instance, over 30 of uh, major misses. And of course, trauma patients, uh, trauma cases can be more complex. And then the garbage in, garbage out meta-analysis by Wu uh, brought things in at around 25 major misses. So is that difference real? I think it is. Our radiologists are overread routinely at an average of about 20% of their entire work. And so we have, a again, a very robust QA system that I think has resulted over the years in exceptional accuracy. But that said, uh, misses are still made, certainly. So one radiologist, again, this is uh, Leonard Berlin's data that you'll see frequently cited in any discussion of MedMal, but this is pretty much how he boils it down. At 14,000 studies a year, you'll have one claim every seven years or approximately 100,000 studies, and there will be one settlement for every five claims. So I, I will use the phrase indemnity as well. Indemnity is a phrase that encompasses both a settlement or a jury award. Some uh, payment to the plaintiff beyond the legal costs alone. All right, so a VRAD radiologist is actually at slightly higher risk, and I think for good reason. We read a higher study volume because of our efficiencies. Uh, we have a distributed model, which means we're not necessarily buddy-buddy friends with all the people on site, and that might lead to perhaps a little more finger pointing and uh, under the bus throwing. Uh, in addition, we have greater exposure because we read ER cases, and there's no question that ER cases are higher risk. That uh, UW did a study recently that showed this: 46% of medical of radiology malpractice actions are stemming from emergent emergency department patients, and that only accounted for 18% of the volume. So they're clear, and it makes perfect sense that this would be so, right? That emergency presentations are usually acute conditions, potentially life-threatening that need to be diagnosed in a timely fashion. So we have an incredible repository of MedMal data. And I just wanna say, talk about garbage in, garbage out. This definitely was that. But I went back through all of the data that we have on all the radiologists. Some of this stuff dated back to 2004. So we had MedMal data on 814 radiologists, and this is how it all broke out. And 
unfortunately, this is just a snapshot, right? And all of these 814 radiologists were at different phases in their careers. So it's hard to draw good conclusions from this. I'm gonna go back into this spreadsheet at some point and see if I can really sort it out. But the thing that really struck me was out of total number of claims, 960 claims, 26 went to trial. 26 went to trial. And we have documentation of one plaintiff award. That's pretty spectacular. So uh, it gave me some hope. So as far as this analysis goes, I took 41 months. So we're June 2017 to October 2020. Over that time period, we read almost 20 million studies. At that rate, the expected number of claims would be 195. And using Leonard Berlin's statistic of one uh, indemnity per five claims, we would expect about 39 settlements. And we were a little higher. We were about 10% higher in claims, 220. And we were about 25% higher in settlements. And again, I attribute that to the ER nature of our work. Okay, so of those 220 claims, we had 36 that were opened and shut, simply summarily dismissed by some court official as being utterly bogus and without basis. We had 136 that were closed without indemnity, for which we spent a total of $6 million in legal costs. That was money well spent. Right, so that's open and shut, meaning a uh, basic assessment was done, perhaps some initial depositions, uh, and ultimately, again, thrown out with no actual indemnity incurred. So lastly, then we had 48 cases with indemnity. And those are the ones, of course, that are of interest to us. So of those 48 cases, I excluded three. We are not, ex well, we weren't over this time, exclusively teleradiology. We read, owned a few practices, New York, Pennsylvania, New Mexico, that also did procedures. And from those sites arose uh, these three cases. So there was a breast biopsy causing pneumothorax. You know, I had a residency colleague who did that in residency and nobody ever let him forget it. And so I felt kind of bad because obviously it did happen again to someone else. Uh, we had a, an incorrect dosage of intrathecal contrast that resulted in a seizure. And we had a guy who literally bought a new angio jet and then wielded it in what I can only describe as a reckless manner. And so those were three procedural cases. We are purely diagnostic in the teleradiology world, and so I've excluded those. And so what that leaves us with is 45 cases on which I have done an extraordinary uh, in-depth analysis. I have to tell you, I spent about four months doing this, two months at a time uh, in two segments. And I I stopped eating, I stopped sleeping, I stopped shaving, I stopped washing. I came out of my office really looking like the Unabomber uh, with this bizarre grizzly beard and all of that, but it was worth it. So you can see I went through everything, every aspect of these cases. I read the depositions, I read the reports of counsel. Uh, many of these spanned a uh, great many months, and so it was uh, quite a lot of work. But I basically, categorized them all and incorporated all the data I could think to into these. So let's take a look at how they all break out. Far and away, the greatest risk is the CT abdomen and pelvis. Certainly that makes sense. You're basically looking at uh, far more organs. And uh, you know, of course, in my opinion, as a body imager, far more complexity, uh, those neuro guys and their symmetric organ. <laughs> The other one uh, that stood out was actually the chest x-ray, because when you look at the cost of an individual case, the CT abdomen pelvis and the chest x-rays all averaged greater than a million dollars in combined indemnity and legal costs. All the other cases you see up here actually averaged less than a million dollars. All right, how did they break out geographically? Well. What's up with the Northeast, huh? I mean, unbelievable. New Mexico has a little cluster there as well. Now we did have a, a, a facility down there where we were doing on-site radiology on our platform, but that actually wasn't the real contributor and you'll see why. So here is how they broke down in monetary value. 
And the big winner in absolute terms is Pennsylvania at 6.6 .6 million. But this has much more relevance if you look at it in the context of uh, how much volume do we have from each of these states. So here is the percentage of our MedMal payment, of our total MedMal uh, indemnities. This is the percentage for each of these states. And I divided that by the percentage of our study volume for each of those states over that time period. And what you come up with is a relative risk of medical malpractice. And so here they are. Now, I want to point out very quickly, Nevada, Wisconsin, and Connecticut are spurious. They were single cases that uh, resulted in these skewed risk ratios, and I don't take those as real. And by the way, I will be talking about the mismanagement of medical malpractice cases. I would like to say we had a different parent organization during this time period. So it does not reflect on our current management or ownership. It was how things were handled by the people that owned us previously. And uh, it's funny, this analysis actually resulted in the firing of one of the people in charge of that because uh, it just, it made the problem so clear. So uh, as a result of the management of certain cases and some things beyond people's control, Nevada, Wisconsin, and Connecticut really are not for real. However, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, those are real. And those are the big risk states. The surprising things in here, New York. <laughs> Everybody says, oh, New York's got to be the worst. It's not. Um, it actually comes in at 0.66. California also just a 0.6. So not as big a risk. Even Florida isn't uh, on the level as those states I consider to be real problems. So the ones that you might have guessed were problematic we're really not so. The other one I think is funny on here is Texas, that tiny little, what is that, 0.03? Texas has that uh, those crazy gun laws and I think they just solved their own problems. <laughs> All right. So let's look at totals here in terms of what were the most expensive cases. The most expensive indemnity we paid was $5.6 million. That was the Wisconsin case, and we'll be looking at it, but that's the only case that went to trial. That's that one case that went to trial and had a plaintiff award. And uh, when you talk about case mismanagement, that's the doozy. I was screaming and waving my arms, if you can imagine, that this case should never have gone to trial, uh, but for some reason they just, uh, took the bit in their teeth and uh, took that one all the way and it was a foolish thing to do. That actually, we appealed it and that cost us a further $400,000. So the total bill was $6 million on that. So I refer to the particular individual that forced this issue as the $6 million man to this day. Uh, in terms of legal costs, there's just a, an obvious correlation between the duration of a trial and the legal costs. And so our most expensive trial was this little fellow with the uh, bowel mal rotation at the top. And that trial was also our longest, which had a duration of 80 months. So the average duration for a trial from the claim to the resolution or indemnity was 36 months. And again, the longest being 80. All right, so how do these total up? Well, for 45 cases over 41 months, we spent $44 million. So about a million dollars a month is our medical malpractice bill. All right, well, this was an interesting question. I went back through and took our career long QA data and productivity data for all the radiologists. Now, there were 45 radiologists. We only had QA data on 38 because of some of those practice ownership issues. And we only had productivity data on 31. So it's not a complete sampling, but the trends are clear. The question was, is this inaccurate radiologists that are being sued? Or is it the uh, hyperproductive radiologists that are going too fast that are being sued? The answer is no. Bizarrely. Uh, two thirds of the radiologists involved in a suit 
we're actually below our average miss rate at VRAD, and two thirds of the people involved in suits were below our average productivity rate. Interesting. Uh, the one thing I would point out here is the median values for both of these things are well below our average. People cluster. Um, I think if you looked at all this data across VRAD, probably two thirds of people are below the average for both miss rate and productivity. But I think the lesson is apparent here that uh, perceived inaccuracy or hyper productivity don't actually contribute to your risk of a lawsuit. The other thing I'd like to point out is look at that one MMR at the top, 7.34. I said, well, that's not possible, right? We draw the line at an MMR of three. If you run an MMR of three, you're hearing from the QA committee. And if you do it quarter after quarter, you're not going to be around for very long. So I looked at that 734 and said, how can that be? And I went and looked it up and, and that radiologist worked for VRAD for two months. So the system works. <laughs> so there were our averages. If we take that guy out, the average MMR for a radiologist involved in a lawsuit was actually 1.14 instead of the average of 